As you can see, my name is Jakub Kozowski. I'm a Scala developer at Scala C. And today we're going to talk about macro sorcery. So seeing this title, you may be wondering, what does it even mean, right? So sorcery isn't a real word. It's just a mix up of source and sorcery, like magic. It's just meant to uh, sound weird, but um, it s signifies that <clears throat> some people think ma macros are some kind of black magic, some kind of sorcery, right? And I'm going to try to persuade you to think that it's not like this. So if there is one thing macros are not, it's black magic. So I guess we can continue. So we'll begin by um, saying why, actually, why we are here, actually, and what we are going to learn throughout the whole uh, talk. Then we'll spend some time uh, watching me code, hopefully, if everything goes right with the equipment. And then we'll take and spend some time uh, summarizing uh, what we've learned and uh, what we can do with our knowledge later. So, right, uh, I've said a, thing, a few things about myself. Now, who are you? Um, I have a, one question to you all. How many of you are Scala programmers or have written Scala at any point in their lives? Okay, so that's about half of you. So if you, if you are not a Scala developer, you're going to benefit from this talk as well, I think, I hope. And you'll learn regardless. So why are we here? So not all of you have had their hands up when I asked about Scala development. But I hope all of you are developers of some sort. So we are developers. And as developers, uh, we want to write good code. And sometimes our code is not perfect, as you know, probably. Well, hopefully not. Hopefully it's perfect. But sometimes we want our code to be better. And to be able to write better software, better code, we need to learn. And that's why we are here. We are here to learn. Uh, specifically, sp three things. So the first one is how to avoid writing boilerplate, because b let's be honest, no one likes writing boilerplate. Uh, the second thing we are going to learn is how to avoid runtime overhead in our programs, because again, no one likes it. And the third thing we are going to learn is adding additional static checks in our programs. Because surprisingly, if you're a, a Scala developer or some other uh, type language developer, you, that's something we like in our programs. And what's common about these three things is that we're going to learn how to achieve those goals with macros. So that's we, why we are here. So what are macros? I think that uh, if you've uh, been developing for at least a few years or months even, you may have heard a thing or two about macros, but Sometimes you don't really know what they are or, or what, why you would you use them. So let's make sure we are on the same page. And I'm going to try to explain what they are. So macros are, in essence, metaprogramming. So when, when you are programming, you are writing code. When, when you are metaprogramming, you are writing code that writes more code for you. So like code generation, but not really. So it's basically code that writes code, as I said. And in the, uh, in the case of Scala, uh, macros are you know, rewriting code during the compilation. So whatever comes out of your macros is validated by the compiler as normal code would be. So it's cool, I think, if you like the compiler. And if the compiler likes your code. So there are a few things, uh, a few uh, kinds of macros. Uh, that are possible in Scala and in other languages. So we're going to talk about two uh, today because they're the most commonly used ones. So the first one is an annotation macro. And surprise, it's used like an annotation. So here's this an exa example. So it basically looks like uh, a normal an annotation you would add to your code, uh, to your trait or something, to your method. And can do very, very many things with your code. So we can add methods to your class or trait, or, or it can add some helpers. 
some implicits probably. So it's pretty cool. And currently, if you want to use macro annotations, you need a compiler plugin called Macro Paradise. And that's the only way for now. So this is annotation macros. And the second uh, kind of macros I wanted to show you is a dev macro. So again, surprise, uh, it's used like a function, you know, dev, like function in Scala. And uh, here's a sample of that. So here we have a cached macro, which takes some time and some expensive call, for example. And it can transform whatever we put inside to make sure that we don't call this expensive method uh, every, I mean, in less time than 15 minutes. That's one example. And I've seen such a macro, it exists, and it's really useful. So it, uh, a function macro, a def macro, can transform its arguments ASTs. And now we're going to talk about ASTs. So for those of you who don't know, ASTs are abstract syntax trees. So it's basically a syntax representation in, in your compiler. So that's what's, what's, what comes out of the parser, or may, maybe after some other compiler phases, after parsing. Um, and it's abstract because it's independent of grammar. So an AST stores information about your code, and, but Usually, it doesn't care whether you are using uh, some specific uh, syntax features, like if you are using uh, parentheses uh, for arguments or uh, curly braces, or maybe you are using infix notation instead of dot notation. It doesn't care. Uh, so an example AST looks like this. So this is an apply block at the root. So it corresponds to a function application in Scala. So the left-hand side is uh, basically the receiver of the function, so whatever you call the function on. In this case, it's, uh, it's defined as a, an identifier by a term name called print line. So you may be already uh, expecting what this is corresponding to, the whole tree. And the right-hand side is basically just a list, a normal Scala list of parameters. In this case, we have only one which is a literal with a constant value of hello world. So obviously, the whole tree corresponds to print line hello world. And here you can see that it's actually a pretty complex structure for something really simple, right? Like the first thing you write in a new, uh, new language you learn, it has like eight blocks in a tree. So it's not very readable. And that's good because we have alternatives for expressing our SDs. Uh, now, we'll go back to these later, and for now, let's go to the part where we, we learn how macros can help us. So the first case I mentioned is avoiding boilerplate. So boilerplate is uh, just code that you need to write uh, possibly many times in slightly different, uh, different variants. So basically, something you can't generify more uh, with the language you are using. And one uh, example of boilerplate in many applications I've seen is JSON. So if you want to serialize a class to an instance of a class to JSON and read it from JSON, you need to write quite a lot of code for every class you have. So let's say we have this person and we need to write this code probably uh, for every field that we have. So we have a line for every field that we have in our code in our class, and then we need to read from that uh, in the from JSON method. So this approach is actually not very, um, it's not a, a lot of code. It's, uh, it's quite readable, but imagine if you had like 10 fields in your class, or if you wanted to change something, like change the name of a, of a field, so you would have to do that in at least four places. And if only, three of them would be able, you know, possible to refactor automatically. So this actually causes some problems when you have more code or if you want to change this. So it's not very maintainable. So this, this is like exactly the definition of boilerplate. Now with macros, we might have done it way easier. So imagine we have the same code, more or less. So we have just the per create a person and then converted it to JSON, 
and then we use that JSON to convert it back to person. And guess what? This is all. We don't need to write anything else, not even the to JSON or from JSON implementations, because if you are using the right macro-based library, and there are like plenty of them, we can just do this, and without any reflection in, com in runtime, we're going to be able to serialize and deserialize our class. This is pretty cool. And another example of scrapping boilerplate with macros would be when you want to update a deeply nested uh, field in a structure. So let's say we have these classes this time. So a person now has an address, and an address has some other fields. And we have a person instance, and we want to change this person's address's street. For example, let's append a st to it, like in the states. So with normal vanilla Scala, we would need to write something like this. So if we are going to be immutable, right? So we are copying the person, copying the address, and then changing the street to add a st. So this is, again, not very, uh, I mean, it's quite a lot of code for something so simple. And it would be even worse if we had a more complex data structure. It would start looking like this, so like PHP. Uh, this is, um, of course, it's not uh, idiomatic PHP, but some people still write this kind of code. And we don't want to be th those people, right? Right? OK, hopefully so. So now the solution. And I'm going to mention a, a name you'll hear hundreds of times during many Scala talks, and maybe you have heard already. So we are going to use a library called Shapeless, uh, because it has some nice features, especially for this kind of thing. And we're going to use a data structure called Lens, this, in this case for Shapeless. So this is the same code we had before, and now we'll have to import shapeless and everything from it. That's not a lot. Now we create a lens on the type of person and guide it to the field we want to update, so to address and street. So real simple, only two lines so far. And then we, we use that lens to modify the, the, field we, uh, the object we have and pass a function that modifies, that returns a new value of, of the street in this case. And this is all. All we need to do to change that field. So it's way more readable and less writing and less error prone. And also lenses are very, very composable. So if you wanted to update like two fields at once, it wouldn't be a problem. So it's really cool. I recommend checking it out. There, I think there is a link in, in that lens word. It's OK. And so this is a boilerplate. We, we've, we are gone with the boilerplate. We don't have it anymore. Now, runtime overhead. An, it, an interesting problem. And our problem, problem for that will be creating a generic array of some elements. So that would mean without macros, we would have code like this. So we, create, we have a method that takes a, a type, uh, has a type. Uh, it takes a size, which is an integer, and an element that will be filled in every, every uh, index in that, that array we are creating. So we, of course, need a class tag because, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to create an array of type t. Uh, now we are able to do it. And we fill it with, with our element. So this is pretty concise. It's almost pretty, almost pure. And this is the kind of code that we like, isn't it? Well, I guess it is. But it's just one major disadvantage when it comes to performance, especially if you are putting, gonna put in it some ints or booleans, some primitive values. It will use boxing. And boxing, as I've recently learned, is very, very expensive. So it, it lasts as much, takes as much time as 25 uh, times incrementing an integer variable. So it's like very, very long. You can, you can see that on your own. I hope you don't need to. <laughs> now, one solution to that in Scala, our beautiful language Scala, which I totally recommend to everyone, is specialization. So I'm not sure if every one of you have heard about it, of the Scala guys. But 
what it means is, is that we specialize on our type T, which means that uh, the bytecode we generate from this method, this is the Scala compiler generates, is going to be like cl cloned 10 times for every primitive type, like, and there are nine of them, and the reference type object. So this pretty fine. I mean, when, we, when you use this function with the int type, you're, you're going to have uh, a version of this function which doesn't use boxing, like out of the box. But it has a major disadvantage uh, again, as uh, every solution is going to have some disadvantage. So it's, it's very viral and heavyweight. I mean, uh, specialization is. Uh, what does it mean? So when specialization is viral, because whatever you call inside that create array function is going to be specialized as well. Uh, so it's going to you know, throw a lot of code, a lot of the byte code. So your jars are going to um, grow fast. And it's heavyweight because, as I said, you have 10 versions for every, uh, every type parameter you have. So if you had more, like two or three parameters, for the type, we'd have a hundred or a thousand versions of the same method in our jar or class file. So this is not very good. Of course, you can, uh, you can specify the types that you want to specialize on in parentheses for, for specialized, but it's, not, it's again not a great solution for, for the problem. Now, we can overcome all these problems by handling primitive types manually. So let's do something like this. We'll, uh, we are not using specialization in the create array function. And we're taking the class tag and checking if it's the class tag of type int. And if it is, we'll call the inner function with element casted to int explicitly. So because it's specialized as well, and the array is going to be casted and whatnot, it's not going to be to use boxing, of course. Uh, but we would have to write this case for uh, nine times and then uh, a wildcard for objects. So again, this uh, looks like boilerplate. So it's a problem. Uh, but this solution, I mean, the specialization in the inner method doesn't uh, cause too much trouble because it's not viral anymore because we have only one call inside it, except the, the four, which is not specialized. Now, again, now the, the problem is boilerplate. So how do we overcome boilerplate? Of course, we do it with macros. So we can create a macro that will specialize our code like, automatically using the way we used before. So we're not going to have to match on the class tag every time we do something specialized. This is pretty cool. And yeah, this, is, this will generate specialized code for, for whatever you use your function with. Uh, but it wants to specialize the whole call chain inside. So it's very cool. And as a side note, Dotty, which is the future of Scala, probably, like Scala 3.0, is going to have a feature for automatic specialization, so we won't have to think about it anymore. You just will have a specialized version of your class or method for only the types you use and only the type combinations you use. So it's going to be a pretty cool feature. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, the third part of what we're going to use macros for was supposed to be additional static checks. So that's what we're going to do. Now, what do we check on? We check on unsafe behavior sometimes. So what's wrong with this code? This is some actor code from Akka, for example. So we are doing some, we are taking a message, we are doing some things in the future some transformation of the, the data we have, and then we send back the results to the sender. Now, the problem with this code is that uh, sender is a method and it's not pure, so the value of sender, by the time we finish transforming our data, it, it may be as well some other actor, so we won't be sending, it to, uh, sending the message to the same actor that sent it to us. This is a problem, most likely. Now, how would we avoid uh, cases like this. How would, would we tell the user of our library, like Akka, that they are doing something wrong and it can bite them in weird places? Of course,
course, with macros, we can do many cool things. We might have a, a, a future that takes a spore instead of uh, T, of whatever. And the spore would be uh, a data structure that, uh, with the right tools like macros, would make sure that uh, whatever is inside it, it doesn't take any free variables, doesn't, doesn't depend on mutable state. So in this case, we would pass the spore to our future, and the spore would be a macro, as I said, and it will analyze the free variables we are using inside the spore. In this case, it's sender, and it would just fail during the compilation if we tried to do something like this. So that would be neat. And it's, it, again, it is possible, and there is a spore library for Scala. This is pretty cool. All right, so we've done the, the why and what part. I hope you are interested now, <laughs> that you know why, we, why you are here. Now the demo. Uh, so for the demo, we're going to need some setup. So this is the setup that you're going to have to do for every macro project you're going to do so far. So first of all, we need this library from SBT, like Scala Reflect. Uh, yeah, the name it may be misleading because you know reflection, overhead, but this is the kind of reflection, I mean macros uh, in Scala are implemented as a reflection in compile time, so you shouldn't worry too much about it, hopefully. Uh, there's one thing you need to remember when working with macros, you need to compile your macros first and then compile the code that uses them, because macros are code themselves. And in, in your macro code, you're going to have to import uh, reflect macros black box or white box, more on that later, and more on the compiler first later as well. And if, you're, if you want to use macro annotations, you're going to have to use the compiler plugin of Macro Paradise. And that's it. So this is pretty straightforward. Now, how do we compile first and then use macros later? So there are if, yeah, b before every use of, macro, of a macro, you need to compile the macro itself. So there are a few ways to do that. The, f the simplest one, I think, uh, the fastest one for prototyping would be SBT console, or maybe one of the fastest ones. Uh, so you just run SBT console in your project with your macros, and you'll have your macros available in your console straight from when you run it. You can also define uh, SBT subprojects in your project. So one of them would be a macro project, which you had, would have the macros. And another one which would just depend on it and use the macros. So the compilation order would be sound. You can also just have an external module in your IDE to do that, the same thing. You can just build your jar and import it. So this is what we do uh, you know, when we publish our macros. Now, black box versus white box. What does it even mean, right? So when you are using the black box package, uh, the return type of your macros, of your methods, uh, or of your ma macro functions, is going to be exactly as declared. So the compiler won't try to infer, infer the type further. And with white box, uh, you can return some more specific type. Uh, so yeah. And so if you still don't know what it means, it means that if you had a macro that says it, re it's it returns a, a sequence, uh, with white box you might return a list and y you would have that as a list and not as a qu sequence. So with black box you would need to cast it to the list or something. And there's an important thing about it. White box macros are considered unsound by the creators of macros in Scala, so they are going to be gone in the future, uh, hopefully. Now, finally, some macro code. So to, to write a macro, we need to create a function. I mean, this is a dev macro. This is what we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So uh, we create a function that takes some, optionally takes some parameters as a return type and delegates all the work to, to a macro. And the macro function here has, has a context parameter from black box, because we use that one. And it returns an expression of that same context uh, of type unit. 
So inside the micro function, we, we are importing basically the whole universe because it's actually the same code, more or less, that's used uh, in the compiler. So it may sound like unsafe, but it's fine, I promise. And inside un the un universe, we have uh, a lot of uh, useful tools for creating expressions and manipulating the ASTs. For example, reify, which basically takes whatever it gets and transforms it into a, an expression. Uh, we can do more with it, but I'll show you that in a second. So this is the most simple macro you're going to see in all your lives in Scala so far. Now, yeah, let's code. So what we're going to do is uh, write a few simple macros. I want to describe them here. But then we'll write a macro that transforms a function, like a mathematical function, into its derivative. So if you're not familiar with what a derivative is, uh, so a derivative uh, of a function is another function which spe uh, specifies the slope of, of the function at that, uh, it's a specific point. So it doesn't matter for this example. Uh, this is just some trivia. So if we have a function like this, the derivative of it is going to look like this. And you can trust me that it's really going to be like this if you don't know what I'm talking about. OK. So let's, for now, say it's just some simplification of a function. It's not, but let's, uh, let's call it that. All right, so now it's time to actually code. And we need to change this place. Uh, I mean, this place, not this place. Okay, so hopefully you're gonna see. Yay! Okay, so I'm gonna run SPT. Okay, let's wait for SPT. Or not, we'll do that later. Is it large enough? Can you see it, the code in the back? Cool. <laughs> okay, uh, so here we have some pl templates for a few macros that we're going to do. The first one, I think, should be get code. So this is, will be a macro that will return the code of whatever we pass inside it. So it might be useful for debugging purposes. Uh, so let's, let's do it. So as I said before, we need to delegate all the work to another function, because get code is lazy. I mean, it doesn't want to do anything. So get code, impl. And we don't pass the parameters here explicitly. So get code impl is going to have a context first. This is from black box. And it's going to have another parameter list with all the parameters we pass here. So it's going to be a. The name must be the same. Sorry. No. So a is going to be uh, an expression from c of type any, in this case, because we don't occur. And it's going to return an expression of type string. OK, so let's do that. So for now, let's just return some, some arbitrary expression just to make sure it compiles. So I guess it could be, oh, sorry. Um, no, let's use reify. So I import C universe all and reify whatever. And let's compile that. OK, so it compiled. And this is step 0, non, sorry, simple macros, get code of something. And we have whatever. So it actually compiled, it ran. Great success. Now, we actually want the code of A. So let's get the tree of A. This is how you do it with expressions. And now we could just, um, if we were able to get a string of that tree, it would be very cool. So let's do a string. That would be a tree, uh, sorry, show code. This is a method from the universe, a tree. And now let's try to re reify that. But I, I think it won't work. So I'll use another uh, feature in the universe. I'll explain that later. So let's do it just a string, and I'll create an expression of it. OK. 
Okay, so let's see if it compiles. Yeah, it did. So now we have something actually here. So this is basically what we wanted. Now, let's say we have a variable called x, called you're not going to see this. And now let's do the get code of x. So what do you think we're going to see? We're going to see x more or, le more or less. So yeah, we got x. This is what we wanted, and it works. It may be very useful. And will, it will be useful for our sample as well, because we have this method called hello that takes the parameter and prints it with hello before it and uh, an exclamation mark. So let's see what code we get when we do like step zero, non macros. Am I right? Right. Hello world. This is exactly what we put in inside, right? Now, what if we wanted to have that inlined, to have the whole print line here in the get code? I mean, as a return value of get code. So to do that, we need to implement hello2, which will do just the, the thing we want to do. Now, Yeah, let's do this. And now let's create hello to impl. The name doesn't matter, but it's just a matter of style. I think people are doing it that way. So let's have an expression this time of type string. And we'll return an expression of type unit. So <laughs> sorry. OK, so now we're going to use uh, reify for real. So we need to import all the things again. And let's do reify and print line. Hello. Let's do this. Hello. Um, S string or S value. OK, so that would be basically what we're going to do. But we don't have the ES S value. And there is a nice thing about uh, reify that inside reify you can do splice on an argument. A splice on an argument will basically substitute the, the value of the argument uh, into the place where you're using it, but only in reify. OK, so let's see how that works when we compile it. So yeah, simple macros, hello to world. So it works. Now. Non macros hello world does the same thing, right? Except the caps here. But it actually behaves differently. And we'll see that when we use uh, simple macros. Sorry. Macros uh, get code of simple macros hello to world. And now the whatever we did in hello2 is going to be displayed here. So we actually have hello with the world and the string here uh, substituted in, in, instead of uh, you know what we had before with none macros. Of course, it's not very beautiful here because it's like we have the string context apply, but actually if I change it to just a string addition, It's hopefully going to look better. No. Of course not. Yeah, so we can see it works as expected. So this is pretty cool. So we basically de did an inline of that. There's an annotation for that. But in case of macros, I think it's evaluated later. Not, not before macros. So it wouldn't work if we inline hello with an annotation. OK, so we have these two methods. Now, there are some other ways to, to create expressions. As I've shown you before, you can use uh, the Q interpolator. So Q stands for quasi quote. And it's a really nice thing if you don't want to do too, many, uh, too much AC work. 
So here we might return a queue. Um, yeah, queue returns a, a tree, not an expression. So we'll need to wrap that in in an expression. So we can we can do like print line, hello, and then we'll need another tree because we can interpolate trees. So we'll get a string. And hopefully it will work that way. And we don't need this anymore. Of course, so it didn't work. But right, I think we can do it like this. Um, right. Of course, again, we need to import. Pretty annoying. And it works almost the same way because we don't have the space, but that would be the same. So it really depends on what you prefer or, or what you're working on, which, which kind of thing you use. But there is also the third uh, method of that. So you can create an expression again and create an apply. So we'll apply some things. So print line is again an ident with a term name, uh, print line, and a list. Um, let's forget the exclamation mark because that would make it totally unreadable. So let's do another apply because we are adding strings. So that would be apply um, on a literal constant of hello. And the list is going to be Wait, no, we're not going to do apply on this. We're going to do an apply on a select. And I'm going to show you what select means in a second. And we're going to take uh, probably an ident. No, right, another ident of term name of door add. This is basically the plus operator after desugarizing and the list. I think we need a term name without an identifier. And we are adding a, yeah, S3. And this should work, so let's see if it does. <sighs> of course, it's not add, it's plus. And it works. So you can see this is beautiful code, of course, and you want to write that. Of course, I'm joking. You don't want to write that. This is why we have quasi quotes, so that you don't need to do the ASTs manually because they are very nasty. So select basically uh, means that when you select A and B, you do basically A dot B. This is really simple. But takes a lot of code, right? OK, so I think we're done with this uh, part. And we can go and write the derivative macro now. So it, let's start with step two. Um, OK, so we have some type alias here, some explanation for what it's going to do, and some skeleton for that function. So let's do it. So we use derive ampl. And drive ample is going to take a context again. And the function. And it's going to return the same thing, so a function. And let's do it. So we import universe. Basically, every time you do any macro, you need to import this universe, whether you like it or not. Um, and yeah, we need to do something to our function. But for now, let's just return some other function to make sure it, we, we can do it, actually. So let's do like x double to x plus 5. Of course, we need to wrap it in, a, in, a, in an expression. And let's compile that and try to run it. Step 2, um, this is macros, derive. Like, whatever. 
Okay, so something went out of this. So let's make sure that we know what, what's coming out of our function. So let's call it the function tree. And let's print it. I mean, let's show its code. You can also do like show row. So we're going to get the actual tree, you know, the AST, the complicated stuff, if you want to. But now we're going to use show code. There's also show. And I think the, the difference between show and show code is almost non-existent. So it's, I, but I'd rather use show code. OK, so let's see again. And yeah, this is what we got. So you can see that this is a, a desugarized expression. So we have the dot notation here. So we didn't keep the imp information about the infix notation here. All right, so now let's do some actually interesting stuff. So what is a function? So a function consists of a list of parameters and some body, right? And this is going to be F3. So you can see that we can actually use Q, the, the interpolator, to, uh, to pattern match on our function, or on our AST that we give it. So this is uh, another really cool thing about quasi-quotes. And yeah, let's see what, what we get. Let's, uh, of course, show code of args and body. Of course, we got an error. F3 args body. Hmm. Let me cheat because we don't have that much time. OK. So this is the same thing we have. All right, because identity doesn't really look well for this. Yeah, so you can see that the argument was actually just a val with some default value, or some placeholder, and this is our body. So let's split that further to get the argument name, because we are going to need it. So the argument is, as we said, a val with some arg name and some type we don't care about and some value we don't care about either. So this is arg. And I can tell you that a value can have modifiers on it. So let's give it mods here. And we don't care about them, so let's just replace them with a placeholder. And now let's see what the arg name is. Now it's X, so it's pretty cool. And let's substitute it here. And then we'll need to use some result body here, which we'll get from the function body we get. So let's do it. Our result body. It's going to be, let's say we're, we're going to have a method for, I mean, to derive our function, we're going to have to extract it to some formats that we know, to some uh, data structures that we can derive. So let's do like extract component from body. And then we'll do like derive on it, and then we'll convert it back to a tree, given it, it's the context that we want. But for now, let's just let's not derive it. Let's just transform it and transform it back again so that we know it's working as predicted. So let's create extract component. So it's going to take a tree. It's going to do a return a component. And let's do a match on the tree. And we'll do it later. So let's define component now. The component is going to have two methods, like to tree and to derive, but for now let's just do to tree. And it's going to take an implicit t C, uh, which is a context. And it's going to return a tree. OK. And let's, uh, okay, let's go to extract component. So we're going to be able to extract some common f patterns. So let's say we're going to extract 
a sum of things and some uh, mm, variable and some uh, constant. So the order appearances. Okay, so let's do just that. Let's start with the sum. So let's say we have a plus b, whatever as they are. And let's create an addition of that our, in our internal data structure. And that will be extract component from A and extract component from B. Now let's define addition, which is going to be A with a component and B, which is a component again. It's going to extend component. And let's define to three now. Well, again, we, we need to import the universe, because why not? And let's do the same thing that we matched, so A plus B. But now we need to convert them back to trees. So this is why we need the implicit, not to write too much. OK, so now we have a sum, but we don't know what components can be in the sum, so let's do that. Now, it would be really, really painful and probably impossible with only quasi codes to do that. So for variables, we'll need to use identifiers with names. And let's say it x, it's x. And we'll uh, transform that to a variable, sorry, a variable of name x. Like, and then x is a string already, so let's define that. So a variable is going to be, take a string for the name. It's going to be a component. And let's do to three. So again, we're going to have to do the same thing that we matched on. Uh, of course, it's ident term name x. And the third thing we wanted, which is uh, a constant, will be a literal constant. Let's say it's A. And let's hope it is a double. And if it's not, we'll make it a double. So that would be a double constant. And the fastest way for that, I think, is to string and to double. Don't do it at home. Now, a double constant of value like A, which is a double. It's going to be a component. And the tree is going to look Almost the same as above, so I can just copy paste it. Um, let's uh, literal constant of a to string, or maybe just a. Okay, so we have the simple building blocks that we're gonna use. So let's see if it actually compiles. Surprise! It did compile. So with what we've written. This should work. This should return a function. So let's see what it returns. Success. We have a function. You can see that is, it is actually in the result. And I can change some things like 10 plus x. And we get it. OK, so we transformed our functions to something that we can actually you know, work on in our program. Now for this. Uh, sample with all these things. This math. We'll need uh, some other blocks. But first of all, well, let's try to define derive and to actually make sure that we can do it. So after we extract the component, we're going to derive it and convert it back to tree, as I said before. So let's define derive. It's going to be just a component. And then we need to implement it for these. So a derivative of uh, an addition is just a sum, an addition of derivatives. So a plus when we do a plus b and derivative, this is the symbol prim. Line. It's going to be um, a prim plus b prim. So this is basically addition of a derive and b derive. Now a variable, when we uh, derive a variable, we just replace it with one. And this is a fact. So let's do double constant of 1. And with double constant, it's going to be even more boring, because it's going to be 0. You can trust me, it's like this. OK, so let's see what we get. Now with 
with the function that we defined. Oh, of course, we can do more than one addition, so we can do like 10 plus x plus 5. So hopefully, we're going to get something that evaluates to 1. And we do. We have 0 plus 1 plus 0. We could elim eliminate these zeros later, but you know we don't have that much time, so we won't be doing it. Now let's do some more, uh, more building blocks. We'll do multiplication. How much time do I have? Let's see. OK, not a lot. <laughs> so let's do multiplication, hopefully. And again, extract component A, extract component B. And we can basically copy everything from here. Because we are lazy, we are programmers. Are we not? And this. OK, and another thing that we want is uh, exponentation. So this is going to be a bit tricky. We'll need uh, math dot, now it's Scala dot math dot package dot power. I looked it up so that you don't have to. So that would be a to power of b. And that will be just power of extract component from a and extract component from b. We need a lot of space for that. Power a component, b component, extends component. And again, these two methods. OK, actually, we'll need to do something here. Uh, actually, we can do it here now, because I forgot to change this. So this is going to be more complicated. The der derivative of a, uh, a multiplication is a sum of, i show you here. So it's basically a times b, the derivative of b, plus yeah, plus uh, the derivative of a times b. Hopefully, I didn't mess it up. If someone can confirm, no. Okay, so let's hope it's it's okay. So that would be an addition of a multiplication of a and b derive, and a multiplication of a derive and b. I'll just look it up to make sure it works as. Expected? Yeah, it's about right. So let's go back to our code. And now the power. So again, with the tree, we're going to do the boring stuff. So Scala, math, package, power, a to tree. I think we could use just math power, but just to be sure it works. That would be it. And now derive. And here we have a problem because we don't have uh, a general mm, formula for derive as d deriving uh, exponentation. So let's do just the case when the left side is uh, a variable and the right side is uh, a constant. So let's do a match on this, because why not? And if it's a power of uh, a variable with something, add a double constant, let's say b. If b is not 0, because that would cause some problems as well. And that will be, yeah, again, some comments. So x to the power of n, when we, uh, to b, actually. Uh, well, yeah, let's call it n, because that's a mathematical description. Uh, will be uh, n times x to the power of n minus 1. You can believe me. Of course you can. Now it can be b because we've used b, so let's call it n. And if n is not equal to 0, yeah. So that will be just a multiplication of uh, n, sorry, of, of a double constant of n, which seems to be b. So it's just a b times. Uh, another power of a to the power of n minus 1. 
no? Of a double constant of n minus 1. And that should be it. I think we have everything for now. So let's see if it actually works. Let's run it with the function we had uh, here. I mean, here. So, there was some. OK, so, hmm, yeah, it should work. So x is to the power of 2. And we don't have subtraction we, because we don't have too much time. So let's just ignore it or add 5. Its result is going to be the same. Uh, it doesn't matter in this case. OK, so let's do that. Of course, yeah, frontize x, thanks. And you can see some very ugly shit here. But that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to write macros, not usual code, so it's going to be ugly. OK, so let's see if the value is right. So um, it should be this. So minus, yeah, minus 4 times x minus 8. We don't have x yet, so let's do x times equals like 4. And let's call it. So that's minus 24. And the derivative was res1. So res1 of 4 should be the same number. And um, hold your, cross your fingers, it's the same. So great success. We have our derivative macro. Now let's get, ba get back to the slides. Um, hopefully the, the screen will work in a second. Yeah, it does. But where is the Chrome window? <laughs> Give me a few seconds. Oh, it's probably on another screen. Yeah. OK. <coughs> Give me a second. OK. So now that we've done the implementation for that, why is this visible? OK. So we did our derivative, we succeeded, so the demo is over. Now we can go to our summary and repeat what we've learned. So the Bart parts first. Macros have some uh, disadvantages as every other code does. So macros give us an opportunity for writing cryptic code that no one else will understand. So this is something we need to keep in my, our minds when writing macros. And they are basically type-safe code generation. So they're not as bad as code generation because they are type-safe, but you know they can still cause trouble. And they are still code, so they can have potential, potential bugs. Imagine you have the macro that, uh, that creates some SQL from your data, from whatever you put inside. And imagine it had bugs like for dropping your database. That would be quite a problem, I think. And it gives you some additional compilation overhead if you're not too careful and if you're doing a lot of stuff during the in, in your macros. So yeah, it can slow down your compiler. And as we all know, Scala is not that fast yet. So this will be a problem. So macros have great power. Remember to use them responsible, responsibly and listen to Uncle Ben. But now, the good parts, the part everyone has been waiting for, hopefully. Macros give you the opportunity to write simpler and safer code. I mean, not for you when you are writing a macro, but for the clients of your library, it's going to be way easier, like with JSON and other samples we've seen. And the easy usage for clients is, is trivial. It's just use it like a function or as, like an annotation. It can cause problems when you are debugging, when you have problems, but on a daily basis, it's going to be you know, simpler and easier. And it's not rocket science. So even I could learn macros, and you are going to be able to do it as well. So I re really think it's very simple. And some people f f make, it more, make it sound more difficult than it actually is. Now the future. The future is very interesting. So the first things from the future is macros are going to be dropped. So no more macros, and you can go away now. Just kidding. Of course, it's not true. So macros will be replaced by Scala Meta. 
which is another project by, project by the same guy who worked on macros in Scala. Uh, his name is Eugene Bormaco, I think. And yeah, it's going to be way more cool. So it's going to, the ASCs in Scala Meta will keep the, all the information like infix notation and all other syntactic features you're using. So it's going to be quite better. And it's going to be easier to write macros. You won't have to import the universe, the context, and all that. So way easier and simpler and not that scary when you look at them. And they are going to, I mean, Scala Meta is going to have better tooling support. For example, in IDEs, like IntelliJ IDEA, you're going to be able to just click a button when you're using a macro. And the usage of a macro is, I mean, the macro is going to be expanded in a place so we can see what is going on inside if you have some weird bugs. And there are, as I said before, there are going to be no white box macros anymore, which is actually fine because they were, you know, uh, more prone to problems. And also, that is going to have another feature kind of connected with macros, which will be called rewriting in the dotty linker. Um, so what it does is basically you can, as a library author, you, you'll be able to define some uh, rewrites. So imagine you are the, the author of the standard library and you create a rewrite from list.length equals zero to list is empty. So you make your uh, clients care less about how they do things and you give them some performance improvements, for example, like in this case. And for now, the only way to do that would be with, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> IDE suggestions and stuff like that. So this is going to be pretty cool. Now, the great question, should you use macros? And the answer is yes, certainly you should macros as a client if you have the right libraries, and I think most of them are right. But should you write your own macros? This is, I think, a more complicated question. It doesn't have an easy answer, but the easiest answer I could find is only when you absolutely need to. So if there is something that you can't achieve with the compiler features and you really need the, the uh, performance of statically compiled code and there is no such thing as a library yet, th then you can do it with macros. So now the summary. The great summary of what we've learned today. We've learned what macros are, uh, how they help us write better code, and how they don't, because they have some problems. And we learned how to write them, more or less. We can explore that further on your own, because we don't have that, that much time. Now, here are some links. Uh, there is a blog post by me on our Scalacy blog on macros, so it uses the same a derivative example, but it's more detailed. There are more explanations. There's a document for, with source for some examples by Eugene Bromaco, which I used before. And there are slides for his talk uh, about Scala Meta from Scala Days Berlin uh, this year. And I really recommend to check it out. I'm gonna also add a link to the Dotty linker part about the rewrites later today. So thank you for coming, and now it's time that I hear your questions. I'm very happy to answer them if you have any. No questions? OK, so uh, you can see the slides for the stock here, and the code will be available here. And if you have any questions that you were afraid to ask or that you don't yet have, you can ask me like, later today or just uh, contact me by Twitter or email or other means of contact you can find on my website. And this is all. Thank you for coming. I have a nice night and evening. Thank you very much for coming.